Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier. Thank you, as always, for stopping by. I hope the week has gone well. Political reflections. Russia throws down the gauntlet to the US on Venezuela. Badra punchline. The Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova acknowledged in Moscow on Tuesday that Russian specialists are indeed in Venezuela within the ambit of a 2001 military technical cooperation agreement with Caracas. Zakharova underscored that Russia's bilateral military cooperation with Venezuela is in accordance with the latter's constitution and has legal underpinning which doesn't require any additional approval from the opposition-controlled National Assembly of Venezuela. The Russian readout of a conversation between Sergei Lavrov and Pompeo. The Russian readout said Pompeo was interested in certain issues related to the developments in Venezuela. It added Sergei Lavrov emphasized that Washington's attempts to organize a coup d'etat in Venezuela and threats to its legitimate government are a violation of the UN Charter and blatant interference in the domestic affairs of a sovereign state. After stating principal differences in Russian and US positions, the officials agreed to stay in touch and continue to exchange assessments. The State Department readout, however, claimed that Pompeo warned Russia to cease its unconstructive behavior in Venezuela and that Washington and its regional allies will not stand idly by as Russia exacerbates tensions. But then you had Bolton in a series of tweets, Maduro has lost the support of the people, he's relying on Cuban and Russian support to usurp democracy and repress innocent civilians rather than sending nuclear capable bombers and special forces to prop up a corrupt dictator russia should work with the international community to support the venezuelan people clearly moscow has weighed the pros and cons of the situation and has decided to be unapologetic about its support for the maduro government despite the u.s outbursts moscow showing no signs of backing off um, and saying it's vitally important for Russia that the U.S., which aspires to be the number one exporter of oil and gas, does not gain control of vast Venezuelan reserves, as that would mean an enormous capacity falling into Washington's hands to manipulate the supply and demand of the world energy market and set the price of oil and gas. In geopolitical terms, a strong Russian presence in Venezuela becomes a negotiating chip for Moscow in dealing with the growing NATO and American deployments along Russia's western borders in Central and Eastern Europe and the Baltic states. That alone makes Venezuela a strategic partner for Russia. Zakharova did not expli explicitly mention Ukraine or the Baltic states and Poland and the Black Sea and the Caucasus but the implicit meaning is clear. If the US interferes in Russia's backyard, Moscow serves the right to retaliate, period. Lavrov's remarks were rather sharp. He, Lavrov, also stressed that the US's intention to recognize Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights would lead to a serious violation of international law, impede the Syrian settlement process, and aggravate the situation in the Middle East. October 2015, I wrote a piece when Putin stepped up at Unger, and I called him a geopolitical grandmaster. And indeed, here again, he's inserted himself, he's become much bolder post-Syria. And uh, I've said previously that, you know, I'm afraid Maduro is going down just like uh, Muammar went down and as did Saddam. I think it's unavoidable. I was describing the age no honest way to explain it because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over. And I was implying that Venezuela has gone over essentially. And then I was also saying the Chavez revolution was always a rebellion in the superpower's backyard and the machine was eventually going to bring it to heel by hook or by crook. And uh, Russia's intervened in that process right now. Access to oil defined 20th century empires and the petrodollar agreement was the key to the ascendancy of the United States 
as the world's superpower America's war machine runs on is funded by and exists in the protection of oil. Threats by any nation to undermine the petrodollar system are viewed by Washington as tantamount to a declaration of war against the United States of America. The Chavez revolution was always a rebellion in the superpower's backyard and the machine was eventually going to bring it to heel by hook or by crook. Andrew Corribico, writing in the Oriental Review, speaks to this issue about oil and gas. He headlined his article, A Venezuelan Coup Could Challenge OPEC Plus and Build Fortress America. Trump, in August 2018, I was talking about Turkey, Pastor Brunson, I was talking about Venezuela, I was saying Trump seems to be relishing his financial warfare strategies. At that time, Maduro was being attacked by remote-controlled drones. Twitter is considering labeling President Trump's tweets that violate its rules, um, but they're going to remain on the platform because they're in the public interest. Twitter has come under fire from some critics who say President Trump's tweets often violate its rules against bullying, dehumanizing, and threatening harm. And to that point, you will recall in December 2016, I, I characterized Trump as a linguistic warfare specialist. Look at the names he gave his opponents, Crooked Hillary, Lying Ted, Little Marker, Low Energy Jeb. These were devastating and terminal. Show us the report, says the House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, criticizing Attorney General William Barr for not releasing the full Mueller report. We don't need you interpreting for us. It was condescending. It was arrogant. My view is it's a complete stitch-up. And most interestingly, those who have invested most in burying this report had been the most aggressive and popped their heads above, a raid, above the raid. I'm talking about Glenn Greenwald. When you go through his uh, uh, tweets, you see his agenda. Katos, I'm talking about all kinds of people. It really is it's like Shakespeare's Hamlet, the lady doth protest too much. Of course, Trump is the one who protests the most. Going back to my article, we have a deviate tomahawk. I said from feeding the hothouse conspiracy frenzy online, a constant state of destabilized perception, timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks, which drained Hillary's bona fides and her turnout and motivated Trump's. What we have witnessed is something remarkable and noteworthy. I said Putin has proven himself an information master and his adversaries are his information victims. And I said the first thing is plausible deniability. The second is non-linearity. So, very interesting developments, but... Uh, Certainly, I tend to agree with Nancy Pelosi. I'm in charge, says Turkey's Ed again, as the lira dived ahead of elections, and that's part of the problem, I'm afraid, Richard Type Ed again. Take you back to an article I wrote, Cold Turkey, in August last year, when Erdogan said, don't get high on your ambitions, you won't be able to make money on the back of this nation. You won't be able to make this nation kneel. Even if they got dollars, we got our people, our God, he said. And I said, in the markets, that's called a Hail Mary pass. But, interestingly, he told young voters in Ankara that Turkey had thwarted attacks by the United States and the West on the lira. He did not name the banks. They can't find lira now. They are struggling in terms of payments. The tables have turned. While they can't do this, the lira firms and the dollar falls, he said. The lira fell 30% last year against the dollar. We must discipline the speculators in the market. You know how I feel. I agree with Mrs. Thatcher. And uh, I do accept the fact that the US, after the purchase of the S-400s, probably, as I wrote in August, the time of Pastor Brunson, Trump is probably relishing his financial warfare strategies and of course Erdogan is not helping himself because he thinks he's King Canute and he's not. Turkey route continues with two-year yields hitting 22%, the highest since November. 
A lawsuit has been filed in Chicago by the family of Jackson Musoni, a citizen of Rwanda, who alleges that the Boeing 737 MAX had defectively designed automatic flight control system. The complaint was filed by his three minor children who are Dutch citizens residing in Belgium. There's going to be a slew of lawsuits, isn't there? I wrote about Boeing. Please read the article. I was totally flummoxed by Boeing's uh, uh, public relations response. First of all, it did not happen until a week after the crash. Huawei's profit soars despite battle with the US. On Friday, Huawei reported that its 2018 profits rose 25%. Revenues rose 19.5%. 45% jump in sales for its smartphone unit. The US government has a loser's attitude, said the rotating chairman Guo Ping. They want to smear Huawei because they can't compete with us. The US has abandoned all table manners. They are the world's biggest uh, telecoms equipment manufacturer with 28% of the market. On Thursday, a British watchdog harshly criticized Huawei for failing to improve on its engineering practices. I wrote about this on the 10th of December when I was writing about the truce dinner in Buenos Aires between Trump and Z, and I said that after the dinner, when guests broke out into spontaneous applause, at the same moment, Canadian authorities were making the arrest of Wan Zhu Meng. So that is still an open question how that develops. Protests broke out in response to the New York City Councilman, Kalman Yeager's tweet, which said, Palestine does not exist. That took me back to yesterday's comment about the Archbishop of Kinshasa saying, you know, no country can be built on a lie.